Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Good morning, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. You know, this morning we are continuing to celebrate the Everything Co-op holiday list. This is our first year of having a holiday list. And this morning we have Nate Chittenden from Cabot Creamery on with us this morning. Good morning, Nate. Good morning. So what is Cabot Creamery and what's your role in it? So my role first is I'm a, I'm a dairy farmer. Cabot Creamery is a cooperative of uh, a little over 500 dairy farms through New York and New England. Uh, we're all working together uh, to make the most amazing dairy products to put on your table uh, that you can think of. We have the world's best cheddar, and we're not just bragging when we say that. We win cheese awards every single year uh, for our cheddars. Uh, we also make some of the best butter you're going to have to use for cooking and for just putting on bread. Sour cream, whipped cream, uh, our triple cream Greek yogurt is also a world war, uh, award winner. It is the most delicious yogurt you will ever, ever have. Triple cream vanilla be green yogurt. But we're a bunch of dairy farmers who are really good at taking care of cows, taking care of our land, being part of our community, working together to send our milk to plants here in the New England area that get turned into those products. So we've put these uh, products that are created by cooperatives in five categories, mind, body, soul, heart, and community. And yours is in the body category. And the reason it was, well, somebody nominated it for that. But the reason I see it in there is that every all of the good stuff that you're your Cabot Creamery's products do for the body. And I'm lactose intolerant, so I really like, I really, I love your Kobe that has zero grams of of uh, lactose in, in every serving. I could eat that with all of the upset stomach and stuff, and it, it tastes wonderful. It's no, so I was eating plant-based cheese, and that does, does, doesn't do it on a taste-wise, but but this Kobe absolutely does it. So you're under body for the goodness. And I'll tell you, every single one of our naturally aged cheeses, because they're naturally aged, is going to have zero grams of lactose. So everything outside of a fresh cheese, you know, mozzarella or something like that, all of our aged cheeses should be zero grams of lactose. So you should be able to uh, diversify your palate beyond that Kobe, which I have a fridge full of in my in my house. But, uh, boy, I can't get past my Alpine, which is my favorite cheese, bar none, that we make. Is that, yeah. is that zero gram, the Alpine? Yep, it's, got, it's lactose-free, just like the Colby. So I've Alpine. tried the Pepper Jack, and I've tried the Extra Sharp. They're nice, but I love <laughs> the Colby, okay? <laughs> Alpine's got, it's got like a Parmesan nuttiness to it, you know, so it's, a, you know, and it's got like, it's just got this earthy nuttiness that it's, it's something a little extra if your taste buds are saying, I, I want a little more than just sharp. You know, and then we've also got our five year cheddar. If you are become a real cheddar cheddar head, you know, you want to get that aged cheddar, which you really get that sharpness, that tang, then you can get go into our some of our more aged uh, cheddars. But all of them are zero grams lactose, so explore. <laughs> but you know, and I appreciate that you said we were volunteer that we were put into the body well, category. I, I would say we could do just about all the categories. Oh, okay. Mind, good for the mind, the body, the I soul. Cer- I certainly, my, my mind and soul certainly feel good when I'm taking care of myself. Good for um, the heart. Yeah. <laughs> Giving cheese to other people, there's no greater gift. It does your heart good. Okay. <laughs> okay, you're not only a family farmer, you, you can you can be your promotional guy too. Okay. <laughs> 
I'm not just a, a, a farmer. I'm a customer too. I mean, I, I, I would never be comfortable promoting these products if I didn't use them in my home and I don't, you know, I, we just love them to death. It's, it's great. Uh, we have a Christmas party this weekend and the family's kids have already requested that I make my Mac and cheese because they had it at another party and I did it for a sports team dinner. So now my Mac and cheese is becoming like, this is what I'm doing. If I'm coming to the party, I'm bringing Mac and cheese. What cheese do you use in your Mac? What cheese do you use in your Mac and cheese? Um, I use a combination. I use our, our seriously sharp, which comes actually pre shredded. So it's really easy if you, you know, you need to take 10 or 15 minutes out of your cooking time and it comes in a bag pre shredded. Um, you don't have to take the time to grate it. Um, I'll use a combination of that. I'll use a combination of Alpine. I actually sometimes use a little bit of our Cabot cream cheese if I want to get a little creaminess to it. Um, and then I actually use our Cabot mozzarella as a finishing touch. So when you dish into that uh, spoonful of mac and cheese, you get that nice pull stretch that you get like with a good well-made grilled cheese. I like having that in my mac and cheese, too, just to really... <laughs> okay. but. All right, so you're inviting me up to to the party this weekend. <laughs> well, it, it does start with our Cabot butter, you know, to make the roux, and that unfortunately does have a little lactose in it, so you're going to have to, oh. you might have to suffer the consequences. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so how did, how did you get into this world? Nate, wh- how, what's your background? Where did you grow up and go to school? Uh, uh, I'm quite fortunate to say that I was born. I was born a farmer. Both my parents grew up on dairy farms themselves. So, and their parents before them were farmers. Um, so, you know, it it kind of just generally in the excuse me in the New England area, Northeast, it's usually multi generational farms that we're talking about. People that were born and raised on a farm or lived next door to that farm and. You know, went to school and worked that worked at the farm after school and and wanted to be there in the future. But yeah, today I'm I'm you know middle aged. I have three children, growing too quickly. Uh, they help out at the farm sometimes on weekends and things like that. But they enjoy being on the farm. But I also have nieces, and nephews who are finished college and are back home on the farm. Partners in the in the in the farm with a, with myself and my older siblings and my parents. Okay, why if you born on a farm your grandparents and parents were on that farm and you learned the farming why you go to school and get a your nieces and nephews got undergrad degrees why how does that what why well growing up on the farm we learned how to work hard but you don't necessarily learn how to work smart you know it doesn't matter what business you're in if the only place that you learned is the place you grew up on you're never going to experience how other things are done, how, how a different angle to view a problem. But my parents valued all of, all of their children and my grandparents all valued us having an education outside of just working on the farm. We were not just people that are supposed to be laboring. You know, they wanted to make sure that we were bettering ourselves. And myself, personally, I was kind of the prodigal son. I was the youngest of four. I didn't think there was a space for me on our farm. I didn't think our farm could accommodate myself coming home. So I went to school as a biology major thinking that I was going to go do something else. But I had to leave the farm to realize just how much I missed it when I was gone, how much my family meant to me, you know, all through high school. And and when I came home, I got to see my nieces and nephews get off the bus from school every single day. I mean, I don't know too many people that get to see not just their own children, but their nieces and nephews every single day. And now I get to, I get to make funny faces at my great nephew. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great uncle now. And my, my niece has her son who's just turned a year old. You know, she brings him to the farm on a, in a stroller when it's close to nap time. And, and I get to keep him awake a little while and pester him. And he makes faces at me and, and you, I, you, know, you I make him back a better life. <laughs> you may, okay. Okay. So, Education is extremely important. I got that growing up in West Virginia. My father was in the railroad and my grandfather was in the mines, mining coal. But education, they they just, they drilled it. Got to get it, got to get it, got to get it. Okay, Mr. Prodigy son, um, <laughs> you, you get back to the farm. So when you come back with a biology degree, you get your degree in school? Yeah, I actually I switched from biology to animal science after my sophomore year. I realized that while I enjoyed biology, I did not want it to be going to school for 
years and years and years and years and years to become a doctor or something else. But I did. Uh, I switched over to animal science because, hey, it's still it's a, still a biological science, and that got me a little closer to the path that was closer to my heart. And I still wasn't sure I was going to come back home. I thought maybe I would go and work on a farm somewhere else. But by the time I graduated, everything kind of fit together. My my family, the farm had grown. You know, I was born on a fifty five cow dairy. You know, we milked fifty five cows, which is enough for one household to probably live on even today. But it'd be pretty slim slim living. Mm-hmm. Um, but as my two older brothers came home from school and started their families on the farm, we had to grow the farm. We either had to they either had to separate or we had to grow the farm to get more of an income for three households. But by the time I was finishing college, there was an opportunity to it that our farm was going to be able to accommodate myself coming back and 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 being more than just a hired hand, but also being part of the management. My girlfriend at the time, soon to be fiance, soon to be wife, was a local girl who thought she wanted to be down in Virginia where, where she was going to school for the rest of her life. Well she met me and she said that being closer to her family was good was, was kind of a nice place to live too. So <laughs> okay. everything came together. <laughs> Fantastic. And now you all have three children together. That, that's a yeah. that's great love story. So how many, you had 50, you grew up on a 55 cow farm. How many? In, in 1976, my parents left my grandfather's farm to start over and start their own farm. So they moved about half an hour from where my grandparents farmed and uh, had 55 cows in 1976. I was the only member of the family at that time born on that farm. Everybody else was already on the ground. but And we slowly grew the farm as, as the family grew. Um, so today we have 900 cows that we milk every day. And then another seven to 800 young stock, the, the, the future herd. You know, the, from being born last night at 7 o'clock to being... 22 months old and very pregnant and ready to become a cow. You know, we have all those young animals that we also take care of. And you literally had a cow being born last night? At seven we, have, we have two to three calves born every single day. And never fails Christmas Eve. We'll be all coming in to have dinner, and there will be a cow doing the dance in the back that says that she's probably going to go tonight. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Fortunately, we have not just our family, but we also have an amazing team of, of people outside of the family who work on our farm. So when we look at all the shifts, there is 24-7, 365 days a year, there are people on our farm caring for our animals. We, like, we work in shifts. You know, it's you, would, you wouldn't expect to go to a hospital and find nobody there, right? Okay. Um, our farm is the same way. You, you show up at 2 in the morning. We have people milking the cows. We have people that are checking on animals. You show up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. It's a different shift of people. But... Every single hour of the day, our animals are being cared after. Okay, so why a member of a co-op? Why a member of Cabot Creamery? Pretty easy. Um, we've been a co-op member from the beginning. We have so much work to do. We are really good at taking care of our cows. We grow the feed. We pl- take care of the land. We milk the cows. We, we, you know, we harvest that milk and keep it cool until it can go to be processed. I have no knowledge whatsoever in what it takes to get that milk from my farm, from my cow, to your table. I don't know how to make cheese. I, I, did it, I did it once on the kitchen stove. I made a fresh batch of mozzarella. My wife told me to clean up my mess afterwards, and I never wanted to do it again. It's a lot of work. <laughs> okay. it's a whole, it's a whole, it was a fun hobby for one day, but it's a whole different type of work than what I'm doing working on my farm. So I also can't fill a cheese plant all by myself. Now, there's plenty of of farms that have decided to strike out on their own and make a farm spread creamery and they do it small scale and they cater to a, to a local market and they're doing an amazing job, but it's a whole separate business. I know that by working together as a co-op, we can be as farmers doing what we do best and have other talented people get the milk to the plant, process it into the world's best cheddar and get it to your table, whether you're in Florida or whether you're in upstate New York, or whether you're on the West Coast. We will get it to you. That's not something I could do if I was just doing it on my own. Okay, so those are some of the benefits of being a co-op. I really, I love your story of being born on the the farm, grandparents and great-grandparents being farmers, long list, and now you have 
children that come to the farm and work on the weekends. You have nieces and nephews that have graduated from college and they've come back and they're part owners and managers of the farm. And you met your lady there. She didn't know she wanted to come back. She thought she would go to Virginia. You decided you liked farming when you got away from it. You missed it. You missed the family. You missed the work. It's hard work, but you miss it. So you change your major to animal science from biology, and then you came back and you've been working a farm. 55 cows in 1976 would feed one family. You all have 700 cows that are 900 that are 900 cows. Cows, and then seven to 800 small animals that are, I guess, calves. It's an interesting story. It could be, you could write it under romance or business. But we're going to take our first break. We'll be right back. Please don't touch that dial. And the program is Everything Co-op. I'm having a great conversation with Nate Chittenden from Cabot Creamery and his life and growing up and we've got a sense of him and who he is and how much he loves his family and farming now but he doesn't know how to market products all across the U.S. and uh, he's a member of Cabot Creamery that is a marketing purchasing co-op and that's when a group in this case a group of farmers came together in 1919 and they created this business to market their products and to take the the milk and make other products so cabot creamery is a marketing and producer cooperative so nate what's some of the benefits you mentioned it already this business know how to take the milk and make the cheese you don't know how to do that this business knows how to market the cheese all over all over the U.S., maybe all over the world. What are some of the other benefits of being in the cooperative? So because we are a producer of a, of a commodity, you know, we produce milk on the farm. Our co- cooperative owns the plants that make the milk into cheese, and it gives me a security that I don't have to worry about the milk on my farm doesn't have a home. You know, we talk about supply and demand. You know, if, if I had to sell that milk every single day on the spot to whoever is going to buy it, I might be getting bottom dollar pricing if there's more supply than demand, which currently is the situation here in the Northeast. But by the fact that we own the plants where that milk goes, it guarantees my milk is being picked up every single day. It's, when I go to bed at night, I don't have to worry about our milk not getting picked up. I know it has a home. And so by owning those plants, we're guaranteeing our farmers a value on the product they're making every day because 48 hours after that milk is harvested from the cow, it either has to be turned into something or it's got to be dumped. You know, milk has to be fresh when it gets uh, used, you know, so we have two days to turn our milk into something for our uh, customers to have. Wow. No, I didn't know it was that short of lifespan. We have food safety on our minds you know we are making a product whether it's fresh milk you know fluid consumption or cheese that is something that people need to know is safe that they can trust that the products that they're buying on the store shelves are going to be good for their families um so milk is probably the most tested uh safe and secure product that you're going to buy at the grocery store and, you know, I don't even think about that going into the grocery stores, how safe it is. It's just sort of like it's yeah, an automatic. Yeah, we've, we've gotten to a point in our society, we just assume everything in the store is safe. You know, it's a, you know, if we went back and probably to our grandparents' age where, yeah, you could have spoiled meat, you know, before refrigeration, you know, think about how much things could, could you know, food, food poisoning, things like that was much higher rates than it is today because everything we do is safer. And I think we take it for granted sometimes. You know, COVID and all the lockdowns and everything else certainly was an eye-opener to everybody about how fragile our supply chain has gotten because of that nonchalance about just assuming everything's going to be there when we want to go and buy it. You know, I think a lot of us learned that the supply chain is a lot more fragile. Mm -hmm. Um, There's another benefit of having local 
cooperatives, local milk sheds, you know, sources of your food. You know, it's redundancy in the system. We knew that our local places were not going to run out of product because they were being locally supported. So even if one part of the chain failed, there was another part of the chain to pick up the slack. So what are some of the other benefits for your family for being in the co-op? Our co-op is known to pay a higher price than our neighbors and other co-ops around us for the milk that we're getting because we have a, a, a duty to pay a fair market price that the that the actual the federal order you know it's it's a government that sets the price you know and then the price gets changed depending on where you live where your farm is where your location is it's a complicated formula but at the end of the day habit farmers have a higher milk check uh, than their neighbors around them and on top of that because we own the brand Cabot all the profits that come from selling Cabot products ultimately will be back into our into a, into the farmers hands whether we reinvest that into growing the brand of Cabot growing the infrastructure that make that we're using to process our milk or whether that money is coming directly back to the farmers as a as a dividend or a patronage or whatever you want to call it uh, I don't know the the right term but money coming back to those farmers um, it gets us you know it gives us an, a competitive advantage over dairy farms in other areas or even near us our neighbors that are not in the part of our co-op fascinating so you have a place that you know your milk is going to yeah it's going to cabot it's going to a plant that that equipment in the plant is owned by the farmers so yep. you know you have a place to sell and you know you're going to get a higher price per gallon of milk than somebody that's not in the co-op. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it could flip. I mean, you go back 10 years ago, there wasn't enough milk to meet all the demands. There was a kind of a boom of exports in the country. Um, you know, China was buying lots and lots of milk protein powder for their people. And so there was a super high demand, you know, so at that point, being an independent person that wasn't part of a co-op, you were rolling the dice. You might have been getting a better value because because the you know, the shoe was on the other foot. Mm -hmm. But you were also doing it without a safety net. And I like knowing I have a safety net underneath me. I'll take I'll take a I'll take a little off the top of those highest highs and prices to know that I never have to go rock bottom. Okay, so you're in Cabot Creamery. You're one of the member owners cabot again was created in 1919 for the members and for the benefit of the members it's it's created to take this product and get it to the marketplace so as members you all get a chance to govern the cabot creamery yep our board of directors is 14 farmers who put on their boots and coveralls in the morning just like i do you know, they meet regularly, have to take time away from their own farm to meet and make these decisions with with the assistance from, from staff that work for the organization, a CEO, a, you know, a, a VP of sales, you know, a CFO, all the, all the other acronyms that you can think of that do the day-to-day -day running of the business. But they do it knowing, we, we, you know, with 14 farmer members voting that are actually steering that ship. You know, they serve, they serve at the pleasure of the board. Have you ever been on the board? Uh, I had the opportunity to be what we call the young cooperator member of the board. Um, that got me a seat in the room, and uh, you know, and and I got to see what it was like. I did not have a vote. Um, I was there to listen, and you know, learn. very fortunate to have my opinion asked if they if they included me. But I was more there to learn, kind of a kind of a process. It's a, su a succession planning. Yeah. Um, we have a duty to make sure that our next generation of farmers know how to run this business without just having it dumped in their lap on day one and say, here you go. You know, we need to, to ease people into it, give them that experience to see what it's like. I also serve, I serve in other parts of our, of our uh, cooperative's uh, structure. I'm part of the Sustainable Farms Committee where we're looking at that three-legged stool of sustainability, not just environmental, but economic and also social, you know, that we're, we're making sure that our farms are, uh, have good reputations in our community, that we're taking care of our animals, that we're taking care of the land, um, and just making sure that, that people know that the, what we put on our Cabot products is not just, 
you know, hearsay. It's not just marketing. It's we are as as authentic as we can be. And taste good. Okay. <laughs> okay. That's the part I like. Okay. <laughs> so what do you see for the future for Cabot and your children and your great great niece, nephew? Um I I mean I grew up on a uh, I grew up on a very family farm. We didn't have employees until I finished college. Everything that on the farm was done was done by by family members. The next generation has it much different. You know, if my kids see themselves farming in the future, we're going to make sure that they are well equipped to do that. You know, that we are going to have a strong business that this uh, of our farm is a strong business that that they can move into if that's their pleasure but we're not forcing that we're not we're not i don't have an expectation that my children want to be farmers or have to be farmers i want them to do what makes them happy but they sure love being part of the farm and growing up on the farm um it's, it's something unique to their lives that nobody else in their school you know the school that the public school they go to nobody else in the in that farm in that school is saying that they're dairy farmers you know so it kind of gives them a, a unique story hmm. um but there's no expectation. Uh, I want them to. I want them to make that choice themselves. So, could you have seen yourself majoring in animal science and minoring in business, so you can run the business of the farm and get those skill sets for doing that and managing people, and also the skills that you need to run a cabot creamery? I wish I knew now or knew then what I know now. I think everybody says that, but definitely. So I went to Cornell University, which has a very strong dairy science program, and it's a well-rounded program. I'm not just learning about the science of a cow, it's anatomy, but we're doing lots of ag business, you know, not, you know, learning how to set our business up correctly. Um, our financial partners today are all former classmates of my brothers and mine. I appreciate you, Nate, so very much, and your family and what you're doing with Cabot Creamery and the community. Thank you for taking time off the farm today to be with us. And for everybody else, we'll be right back. We'll be talking with a lady from Equal Exchange. We'll be back in a minute. Please don't touch that dial. everything co-op uh, we just talked to nate from cabot creamery and now we're going to talk to danielle rubido from equal exchange good morning danielle good morning how's it going uh it's going great great where are you this morning what part of the world i am in massachusetts okay yes. you're, in, you're in cold country too all right uh yep, we're cold over here for sure <laughs> So, Danielle, how did you get to Eco Exchange? How did you get a job there? Let's start with where'd you grow up and where'd you go to school? Yeah, so I grew up. Uh, my grandmother raised me. Um, she's she's Italian, and um, right right off the boat from Italy. So, as you can imagine, food was something that was really important to me. I always kind of saw her making sauce in the kitchen and just getting really, really fresh ingredients. And so that was just like always a part of like my upbringing. So I was always really interested in food. Um, for my education, I had my undergraduate in economics and my master's in international relations and economic development. And I've always really been interested in equal exchange ever since I did a study abroad in Nicaragua, which is funny because that's also where the history and roots of equal exchange began as well. But I kind of just saw firsthand um, farmers and was able to see a different variety of farms, some fair trade, some not, and just kind of was asking myself this question, why is it that, you know, people have to suffer so that we can kind of have cheap products? And, you know, to me, equal exchange had the answer. Um, they also coincidentally were geographically like just of um, 10 minutes down the road from the college I went to. So that was, you know, I always kind of knew about them. And um, when I applied, it just it just really made sense for me and 
felt like I wanted my career to have more meaning and not be just about profit. So you are a co-op girl at heart. I got it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so you majored in economics and got a master's in economic and economic development. Did you learn about co-ops in your training, your formal education? No, I felt in my class, I was always that annoying person. Well, what what if, uh, you know, in my environmental economics class, I, I just remember, you know, putting a dollar amount to the environmental impact in it, that would happen. And that just never felt natural to me that 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 should be so connected to money that these decisions that there were things beyond profit that uh, and value that different types of value that we should consider when making decisions um, and long term as well a long term impact impact on our environment on people so I felt like I was always the one asking you know raise my hand well what what about this what about this and um, I never learned anything about co ops in my formal education at all. Me neither. And with my <laughs> MBA, it was, what's the greatest rate of return for the investor? Not any of the other things that you talked about, what's best for environment or best for people, or what's the greatest rate of return profit for the, in, the investor. So you just found that there was a job opening at Eco Exchange and applied for it? Yeah, so I actually... Um was searching for a job and I wanted to be a little more selective. Like I said, I really wanted my career to have meeting just beyond just a paycheck. And so actually my professor who I went um, to Nicaragua with uh, shared the job posting with me. And so I, I didn't know about it. Um, I knew about equal exchange. I didn't know that they were hiring for this particular position. And um, they told me my job was going to be, going around the U.S. doing presentations and educating people about where their food came from. And I said, well, sign me up. That sounds perfect. <laughs> can, I, can I pay you to do that? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you took that job and that's what you did? Yeah, so, you know, we're going to get a co-op. Um, you know, I'm sure you hear this a lot, but, you know, we wear many hats because you have this kind of feeling and energy of, like, that you not only financially own this business together with your coworkers. Um, you just have a different sense. So, so you know, you're kind of putting your hat in many different places. So, we, you know, we all do many things at Equal Exchange. We're all part of a bunch of different committees and um, contributing to the business, kind of just, you know, where your skills meet. So, you know, we do some, e- some emailing to folks. I do a lot of, um, of our event planning, both virtually and in person. And um, really anything that's going to be you know, communicating our mission out there to people. So let me give people a definition of the type of co-op that Equal Exchange is. So Equal Exchange is owned and controlled by the employees of Equal Exchange. Therefore, it's called a worker co-op. And I have it that any business that you can think of could be a worker co-op. The difference, though, is it would be owned by the employees for the benefit of the employees. So that's the type of co-op you are. And so you said you wear many hats. Uh, you are an owner. How many how many member owners do you have now? We have about uh, 115, I would say. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah. so I, I say that just saying that we are growing. So Equal Exchange has just recently connected with another alternative trade organization in the UK. And so um, it, we're still in the process of part of those folks um, adding to our network. Um, it's oddly enough, they started around the same time with the same name. So we always get into it around who started first because they're Equal Exchange UK and we're Equal Exchange US. Um, but now we're all one. So. <laughs> oh, OK. OK. So you, what are the benefits to you? for being, for working in a co-op? Yeah, I think, you know what, now that I work at a co-op, I think it would be really hard for me to ever switch to working to a, for a conventional company. But I think, you know, the fact that it is your business. Um, so, you know, I know Nate kind of talked about this at the end as well, but when you work for a co-op, um, you have shared ownership with the folks that you work with. You're able to serve on the board 
and you also share in the money at the end of the year, right? So that's taken as a dividend that's um, split between um, all the workers at Equal Exchange and given to us um, as a check. So I think when you work for a business that you actually own, you just feel differently about going to work every day. You really have this sense of ownership. And, you know, for Equal Exchange, we actually have uh, shares that we buy when we work at Equal Exchange. It's deducted solely from our paycheck. So that that is a real financial stake in Equal Exchange. So I think it is just different the way that you think about it. Regardless of whatever your role is at Equal Exchange, it's one person, one vote. Um, all the worker owners are a served majority on our board. Uh, so it really just does feel like you're, you have more control over your everyday job and your shared ownership. So it feels like you have more control. And in fact, you have more control yeah. because, <laughs> because the 115 or so members of Equal Exchange and 115 or so owners of Equal Exchange vote for the members to be on the board of directors and the board of directors have to set policies and there you get control you get voice and you said you are on a number of committees yeah yeah so i think i think for me co-ops are really important because it's about sharing power right so when you work for a conventional company the shareholders have the power when you work for a worker co-op you are the share you are essentially the shareholder you have the power you know, Equal Exchange does have different committees. So I'm on the Leadership and Training Committee, the Anti-Racism Committee. So you can kind of choose based on your interest um, how you want to contribute to the co-op in that in that way. And um, these are worker owner committees. So the the first principle of co-op is is co-ops are open to anybody, regardless of race or religion or age or political affiliation, religion. It just it just doesn't make any difference. It's open. So being up in Massachusetts, is your makeup majority white, which is what I would expect? Or do you, um, do you have that sense of what you're, when you say anti-racism, do you, do you have many African Americans that work for Equal Exchange or? Uh, yeah, we do. Yeah. So I think that, um, you know, there's some really diverse areas surrounding Equal Exchange headquarters. And so I think just naturally, um, a lot of folks gravitate uh, to equal exchange just working locally. So I could get back to you on percentages and that kind of thing. So I don't want to um, misspeak, but I, I would say we're fa we're fairly diverse. Okay. Okay. So equal exchange is a few miles from the college you went to, and you just said that people that work at equal exchange live in the community, and it's a diverse community. I have it, and I'd like for you to, to tell me what you think about this, that co-ops are created to solve community problems, but it also helps to just helps the community and the people in the community. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. Um, I think as well, you and I have talked, you know, an, another time just about pay ratios, right? Really, um, you know, so that is one thing that I meant to mention before is that the average pay ratio, I think, is like one to 344 or something like that, which basically means the lowest to the highest paid worker and how, how different that income is. And so just like right built into equal exchanges structure is one to five. So that is very, very different than the traditional. But uh, I think, you know, we do have a portion of our um, income that goes to charitable contributions. The worker owners are able to vote on kind of where that money goes the past few years we've had uh anti-racism as the focus and where money's going so so we we do try to give back to the community and really i think the main purpose of equal exchange is to really have our entire supply chain from start to finish really feel democratic so we also only work with democratic cooperatives abroad we're organized as a worker co-op and um, even a lot of, you know, our consumer supporters um, serve on the Equal Exchange Board. So we really try to invite consumers in so that they really feel like they're a part of our community. And it's not just this kind of transaction, but really it's about human connection. So I'm back on this five to one. So if the in, in Equal Exchange, 
if the lowest paid person is fifteen dollars an hour, that's times that two thousand hours a year, two thousand eighty to be exact. But that's a thirty thousand dollar a year job. So if if the lowest paid person in equal exchange made fifteen bucks an hour, made thirty thousand a year, the most that the highest paid person could make is five times that, which would be one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Yeah, exactly. Where you said the average is three hundred and forty-four. Uh, one to three hundred and forty-four. Yeah, I was looking that up because I I know we had talked about it the other day, and I was wondering what exactly it was. So some some of the bigger companies out there, the the bigger companies have a much higher pay ratio. So yeah, you can do the math on one to three forty-four, but. You know, say, well, I say did it, but I, I didn't believe it, I, and I had yeah. to do it on a put a calculator. I didn't do it. I, so, if the same thing, if somebody made fifteen bucks an hour, that's thirty thousand a year, and if if that's the lowest paid job, then the highest paid job is three forty four. That means ten million dollars a year is what the highest paid person would get. Well, with that, we're going to take a break. <laughs> we'll be right yeah, back. The average too. Yeah, we'll be right back and talk to Danielle. Uh, some more about Equal Exchange. Please don't touch that dial. News Talk 1450 WOL AM, where information is power. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Co-op. Danielle, we've been on the air a little over 10 years, 10 years, two months to be exact. Quite frankly, you, you would notice, but Equal Exchange was one of our first, well, in December, they were on three times that first year, 10 years ago. And in that 10 years, we've been, uh, National Cooperative Bank has been our main financial supporter and cheerleader and friend. NCB's mission is to support and be an advocate for America's cooperatives and their members, especially in low-income communities, by providing innovative financial and related services. And I know at one point, Danielle, that Equal Exchange had a loan with NCB at least 10 years ago. Do you know if they're still doing business with NCB? No, they're definitely a friend out there in the co-op world, and that's part of our, you know, principle six, trying to do business with more cooperatives and um, really foster the cooperative community. So, you know, we, for at Equal Exchange, we, you know, still try to be intelligent financially and have um, kind of a diversified portfolio. So um, I know we also have um, done some work with RSF out in um, San Francisco and um, and NCB has been, you know, a great a great partner over the years as well. Yes. Okay. Um, so you were asking the questions: Why do people have to suffer so can so consumers can buy cheap products? How did Equal Exchange answer that question for you? Yeah. So it's interesting. Equal Exchange, I think, started as well in Nicaragua in 1986 really just in solidarity with Latin American solidarity movements on the ground there. And we kind of found a loophole at the time of um, against the embargo of Nicaragua and realized if we had our coffee roasted in another country, it then became a product of that country and we were able to still import um, coffee from Nicaragua into the U.S. So I think we've always had roots in activism and that kind of a thing. Um, so for me, I think equal exchange, yes, we, coffee is our main product. We were the first fair trade coffee to be imported to the United States. We're really inspired by a lot of the European um, fair trade model and alternative economic models at the time and, and still today. But I think we're really trying to ask this question of what if food could be traded in a way that was fair? So coffee just happened to be the vehicle. But now at this point, we sell other things like, as you know, um, chocolate, tea, avocados, bananas, cashews, um, almonds, pecans. So I think it's really just what what if really that process from where food begins to where it gets to you could be fully democratic if power could be controlled 
and shared and if our environment could be respected if profit wasn't the only thing that we thought about what if it was people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and how long have you been with eco exchange now seven and a half years so do they really walk the talk i mean do they really does eco exchange do what they say they're going to do in this in this world of fair trade and and making sure that food traded it's fair for all, particularly of small farmers? Yeah, absolutely. I think I wouldn't be here for so long if, if it wasn't, right? But um, that I definitely think that we do walk the talk for sure. And that's something that I think, you know, there's obviously huge marketing bu budgets out there that will tell you this and that. And I think that we really are out there doing the work and have been for many years Another thing that's central to equal exchanges mission that may not always be true of all, you know, fair trade organizations as well is we're really committed to small scale farmers. So even as fair trade grew, they started to uh, let in a, a bigger farms, um, huge plantations, and something that equal exchange has always been committed to is um, small scale farms. And all of our farmers are organized democratically into cooperatives, so they have their own democratic models as well. Um, in fact, we learn much from them, and in in that instance, it was a lot of those cooperatives were really started, you know, out of, out of necessity. The farmers are, you know, at the end of this dirt road, you know, we all at Equal Exchange go to source, um, so we're able to see, you know, where the products come from and see that firsthand. We do always do a homestay with with the farmers and are really able to, you know, see the process for ourselves. So the farmers are co-ops, they are co-ops, and then they sell to Equal Exchange, which is a co-op, and then Equal Exchange sells to food co-ops, which are co-ops. Yes. <laughs> so you talk about principle six all the way, cooperation among co-ops, it's all the way through there. Absolutely. Yeah. What, what if we could, what if we all did business like that, right? The world would be a much different place. <laughs> Be because the, the co-ops have the values and principles, and I have it that a co-op is a co-op if it's operating under those values and principles, and if it's not, it's not a co-op. I don't care what they call themselves. But if, if people are really looking out for other people and for the planet, and you have to make some profit, yes, in order to survive <laughs> and grow, but the priority is what's best for the people in those farms, yeah. in eco exchange, in those food co-ops, in yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's something that we're proud of is to prove, you know, by our success that you can have a business, you can care about people on the planet, and also it can be a sustainable business model where, like you said, you can actually make money if we didn't have people buying our products. Um, thanks for suggesting our products on your website as well as part of this holiday guide, but. It, you know, if we didn't have that, we wouldn't be able to succeed, but it's not the only reason, you know, that we exist, right? Yes, and everybody out there, please go to everything.coop, that's everything.coop, and as soon as you go on, there's a, there's a banner that scrolls up and down. The first, the first banner is this holiday list, and you can click on where it says learn more, and it takes you to the list. If you go down under heart, Danielle is under heart uh, with the peppermint and the chocolates and the coffee, bananas, cashews, pecans. Then you can click on their logo and go right to, you can order from there. Or you can find, where else, you said food co-ops, where can they go look for locally eco exchange products? Yeah, so another thing that we're also offering is right on our website, um, if folks buy small bulk, it really can be as simple of a supply chain as we originally imagined, which was farmer equal exchange you. So if you buy directly from us, you are kind of, uh, you know, getting rid of some of the folks in the middle who tend to capture a lot of the profits and don't have that distributed to farmers, as well as your local co-op is the best way that you can buy our products if you really want to take out that complicated um, distribution that is so prevalent. Um, so yeah, you can either buy on your web on our website and then we should be in pretty much any food co-op that's 
that's near you or natural food stores are our biggest partners for sure. Okay. Natural food stores and food co-ops to get natural organic foods. All of your foods are organic, aren't they? Yes. So I would say like most of our products are organic. If they're not, a lot of times we like to support farmers who are kind of in transition into that process. And we know they're really doing all the things right. But in the world of certifications, um, it's a lot of pressure on farmers to be able to kind of jump through all these hoops. And it gets more difficult every year. So really trying to help people, especially who are trying to transition um, as well. So you like Eco Exchange as a co-op because you have a say. You're on committees. You get to go out and meet the farmers. You have a say. You pay some money to become a member, and they can take it out of your paycheck. But also, at the end of the year, you can get a dividend. And the say is one member, one vote. It's democratically controlled. That One member, one vote. I don't know. I guess I would have loved to have worked with an eco exchange or some other employee co-op all of my life. That just sounds like it is wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there needs to be more co-ops out there. Another thing in regards to sharing the cooperative model, like if anyone is out there and they're trying to start up a co-op, they need support, they need help. Something that we always do is we're really open and transparent with our model. If there's anything about how we do things that can be of service or help other co-ops, we've really tried to be just like an informational hub trying to just like pioneer some of these things where they maybe didn't exist before. So anyone out there wants to start a co-op, absolutely, you know, reach out to us. We want to help. So that goes under the fifth principle of education, training, and information. What would you like to leave people with? You have about 30 seconds. Yeah, I think, I think just knowing where your food comes from, but also where all your products are coming from and really that, as an individual, you have power both economically and politically and to not undermine that and to be able to use that in your choices every day, not just in buying your products, of course, but also, um, you know, reach out to uh, your political. Um, Thank you. We got to go. Thank you. Yeah. We'll see you next Thursday, Danielle. It's a pleasure. Please live cooperatively. News Talk 1450 WOLAM where information is power.